Eric, tell us a little bit about, um, you, know, you, you said you live in Sacramento. Tell us about your childhood and kind of like who you are and what, what shaped, you know, kind of the, the force that you are today. So we'll start okay. there, you know, at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a long, it's a long drawn out story. I, I'll it? hit the key, the key points. It's just all, it's a lot, you know? Um, yeah. Well, you know, but also, is, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll kind of pause you here and there to ask questions or to probe deeper okay. on certain things. But yeah, start where okay. you think is an appropriate place to start and we'll see where the conversation takes us. Gotcha. How's that sound? All right. Yeah, it sounds perfect. Cool. So uh, when I was when I was about two years old, um, I was origin like this is this is the first part of my life that I have any memory of. And I was I barely remember it, but mostly what my parents say. I was diagnosed with a disease called um, well, it's it's like cancer. It's histiocytosis. <laughs> and it's a really rare disease. And basically, I was given about two months of my life. I was I was given two months to live. And, you know, I was put into radiation treatment. And I had no chance. Right. Wow. And there was, you know, that that moment where my parents realized they were going to lose me. And it put them through a lot. They had lost a, a child prior to me as well. And wow. uh, one day, we went to the doctor and they said it was gone. And huh. so, yeah. And so I like, I like telling that story. And the reason why is because the, you know, looking back at that moment in my life, I realized that I have a purpose, you know, that I should have died. I shouldn't have made it through that. And it, it helps me in moments where I feel, you know, maybe where I'm stuck in life yeah. now. Yeah. So it's, it's very, well, what's your sense of what happened? I mean, was this a, intervention or did the did the radiology work or what, what was what was it happening? was the doctor literally called it a miracle like oh, literally. No yeah i love that yeah and because of that story too like i have a really uh i'm really tied on my spiritual path with god and mm -hmm. you know the reason why is because he gave me life and i didn't have a chance and so i seek him throughout you know this journey of my life um, mm. so you know growing up obviously i made it through that right Mm -hmm. um, I lived in a small town called Pilot Hill, California, population like 400 people, very small town, uh, a little bit east of Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, from the outside looking in, my family looked like a really great Christian family. Father was a, a prison guard, Folsom prison guard. And my, oh my, my mom God. was a Johnny Cash yeah. song just popped in my head. <laughs> right, right. Everybody <laughs> knows Folsom prison, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. And, and he grew up uh, in a bad place. Like he was, he, he had dealt with a lot of abuse. Both his parents had died when he was very young and he was put in orphanage homes. He was a runaway. And so him, you know, being a father to me and my brother and sister um, was probably a tough thing, not to mention working at Folsom prison and being in a violent, you know, violent environment mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, you know, a lot of times he took that home with him, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of discipline, um, which some of it was loving. And, you know, I definitely blame him for a lot of the good in my life, too. Uh, but a lot of it was abuse, right? A lot of it was um, mostly emotional. Um, at the age of seven years old, you know, we go to church every Sunday. Uh, going to Sunday school, uh, a situation happened where my uh, my Sunday school teacher, a woman, uh, sexually abused me oh at the age of seven. Yeah. And that was like the start of tr trauma in my life. Mm -hmm. And being seven years old and scared and really angry, I, you know, what I remember was just being like furious and scared because I knew I had to go back and I didn't want to mm -hmm. tell my parents. Right. And I, I don't know why I didn't want to tell my parents, but it's how it usually works. Um, I decided to deal with it myself. I went back the next week and I knew I was going to go there week after week after week. So I decided to take matters into my own hands and I actually poured bleach inside of her coffee cup. Oh my. And yeah. And she almost, <laughs> she got really sick. She got really sick, but yeah. That's a little <laughs> but, uh, immediate, immediate karmic blowback for her actions. Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. It, I, from that moment on, because I didn't get caught, um, I was, I was afraid to get caught. So I definitely was shutting my mouth about the whole situation then. Right, right. now it was like, 
which makes like, it worse, obviously. Yeah. So now you can yeah. tell anybody and yeah, you had to deal with a demon mm-hmm. inside. Mm. It actually became like quite a repressed memory. And right. this is something I, I just started talking about this month. Uh, mm-hmm. No joke. So it's been, yeah. it's been 28 years I've held that in or not 28, 21 years since I've held that in. Right. Um, well, and welcome to a new version of yourself that's able to speak about absolutely your past trauma. That's huge. That's a huge yeah. transformation. Absolutely, man. Um, let me, let well, me obviously, pause you here. I want to just pause you here if it's okay. I, because I, I don't want to gloss over the challenges that both emotional trauma, physical abuse, and sexual abuse, you know, present for people. Like, and and not everyone. Um, I mean, yeah, it takes, you took you 28 years to be able to talk about it openly with yeah, others. 21. Some people, yeah. Some, yeah, 21. Some people never get there, right? And so yeah. the fact that you're able to do this and speak about it publicly is really helpful for for those others who have dealt with a similar circumstances to be like, oh, okay, you know, if Eric yeah. can talk about it, then I can talk about it or get therapy Absolutely. or you know, really find help. Because that, those things, you know, when, especially at a young age, you, you just don't have the tools to understand and to, and to process those things. And so it ends right. up getting really, really suppressed in the stuck energy that you carry yeah. with you your whole life, right? I'm That's sure you're going to tell more for about it. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I had I have a little bit of understanding because I had an abusive uh, father and alcoholic right. in my family and whatnot. So I had to deal with that in my own way as well. But, um, man, I really feel for you, especially sexual assault. I can't imagine what that would be like. Um, I know yeah. a lot of people. It's, it's far more pre- prevalent, I think, than people are willing to admit. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, you know, the statistics say it's like one out of four people in, in, yeah. in the world, you know, have gone through a sexual abuse situation. And it's definitely, you know, it, I think that's another reason why I want to talk about it, because mm-hmm. I think a lot of people can relate to it, which is sad. Yeah. It sucks, but it's mm-hmm. truth. Um it's really what happens after that, that is, is the problem. If you hold it in or you repress that memory, which I did, what happened was I, it, it completely changed who I am. Right. Mm -hmm. I was no longer a seven year old kid enjoying my life. Like I had just tried to murder somebody like, right. I can laugh about it now, but, uh, (laughs) I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. No, in, a, in a twisted way, it is. Right. And I got away with it, first of all. And then also, she never did it again after that. And so what I learned in that moment so was she it knew. was okay. She knew what she, happened. Yeah, she had to have because she didn't look at me, touch me ever again. Um, <laughs> I, I won, right? You won. Yeah. But what it taught me at seven was it, it's, so it's okay to retaliate, right? So I, right. I actually became and, and built some violent characteristics that plus you know my family life my family my home life and um you know just the trauma itself you know i had a lot of really bad temper tantrums kind of off the hinge anger issues Mm -hmm. as a child just uncontrolled um Mm -hmm. and because it, it changed me i you know going back into my family and living with them the years after that what they, I didn't fit in. Right. Like I wasn't me anymore. I wasn't like them. They didn't know what was going on. Right. And so I was treated even more differently. Like there was, uh, most of my life, I was the scapegoat of the family. I don't know if you've ever heard of that term, but just this, I I was the, I was the smallest and I was tiny, man, like small my whole life and just picked on a lot, um, Mm -hmm. built like bullied at home. And, it caused but a lot of siblings? issues. Siblings yeah. or your your parents or both? Uh, well, my my father, you know, he did a lot of it and he encouraged it. And, mm. you know, it, it honestly, my telling my story has caused a lot of turmoil in my family. And, I bet. But, it, yeah. but for me, it's like, I don't, they don't, they don't want me to talk about this, of course. But the truth right. is, it's like, this is my purpose and I'm not afraid to explain what it is. I went through all that. Right. I went Mm -hmm. through all of it. I should, I have every right to talk about it. That's right. So I'm going to, hopefully they can accept that. Right. And then we can just move forward. And if they don't no. so what? That's it. That's what it is. It's their choice. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you're doing the right thing. Good job. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, a, a lot of that, a lot of 
in-house verbal, emotional, and, and some physical abuse, not crazy, but, you know, I, I, sometimes it got out of hand. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, eventually what, what I did is I, I found some painkillers that my mom was hiding, um, that she had from like kidney stones or whatever. And I didn't really know what they were, but when I was eight, I tried one and I loved it. I mm. loved it. And I, from, from that moment on, I, I realized that I could hide from the pain. I could numb it. And, you know, I could run from it through substances, through anger, through violence, you know, and just being depressed. And I was bit, I've been suicidal since I was eight. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, obviously I couldn't get my hands on pills that young all the time. So, I mean, I'd go in the, in the medicine drawer and grab Dramamine and eat the whole <laughs> bottle. I would drink the whole bottle of Robitess and I would, you know, take four doses of Benadryl just to like, I would do anything it took just to get out of that pain, that trauma, Mm -hmm. you know, and that caused its own problems because when you turn to drugs, obviously drugs brings on its own amount of pain in your life. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to add to that trauma, you know, eventually, you know, going into high school, getting into lots of fights, um, really doing horribly at, at school. And just not giving a fuck, honestly, just not caring. And Mm -hmm. a very insecure person, uh, very sensitive, very negative. And because of that, I think I, you know, the only thing that made me feel like worth living was being high or Mm. being drunk, just, or being crazy, right? Like I wanted to be that crazy kid. And I was like accepted as that. And I liked that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that became going down. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. It, it's who I was. Like I was so Eric are Rogers. Are we talking about a teenager at this point, or are you still into your twenties? Yeah. When that's yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a teenager at this point. I'm in high school, and you know, dabbling with harder and harder drugs. And by the time I'm 17, I got my hands on cocaine. And the okay. way I work, and the way I've always been, is like if I try something, I'm going big. So I ended up. <laughs> that's, You're all in. That's, yeah. I'm all in, 100. percent So I'm either a bad influence or I'm a good influence, right? And so right. I, I took it to the next level and I started selling it, and I started getting people hooked on it in my in my hometown, and making money off of it. And my dad found a little straw inside of my my backpack, and he he's a cop, so he tested it, you know, his little field test, mm-hmm. and he called me. He's like look, dude, you're done. Never, never come around this house again. If I ever see you here or around any of our family, I'm taking a jail myself. Like that's it. Mm-hmm. You're done. And basically they threw my shit out and I had to come get it within 24 hours. And I, at 17 years old, I had a job. I worked at round table and <laughs> I had a Honda, a Honda Accord and that's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. I was wow. kicked out of the house. So I was homeless at 17. Um, and I just wasn't prepared for that, bro. It was really mm-hmm. like a, a shock. And that, that moment, it was a shock, but it was freeing because I was finally mm-hmm. released from that, a big part of my pain, which was the emotional abuse, abuse from home. I was like, okay, cool. Like I'll figure this out, whatever. Um, the first night that I was out uh, of the house and homeless, I went over to a friend's house and I was introduced to methamphetamine. Oh my. So I didn't know what it was. I tried it. It was Coke. I thought it was Coke. It was meth. Uh, I ended up taking that to the next level too. So mm. now I'm, I'm a meth addict. Um, and now I'm actually starting to hang around people cause I didn't have a place to live. So I'm hanging out with people to stay on the couch. And these people are like the most evil people I've ever met. Right. This is, <laughs> it's insanity out there. Like in the meth world, mm. in the drug mm. world, there's some really bad people and they were all I knew. They were, they were the only people that accepted me or wanted me in, in their life. And so I took it and just, I mean, I, I was held at gunpoint. I was held at knife point, held hostage, threatened to be <laughs> killed like multiple times. And it's just because they were high and paranoid. And that's the type of people they were like, mm-hmm. I, you know? And so, this journey is just, it's just, it's, I'm lost, right? Yeah. I'm right. just lost and trying to find truthfully, like any, any reason to live, which would be like the drugs are the only thing that made me feel like I, I could even make it through, 
without mm-hmm. drugs, I can guarantee and promise you that I'd be dead right now, which is wow. That's yeah. an interesting statement. Yeah, because it kept the, me alive they, because they got you through the pain. Mm-hmm. So you think that what would have happened if you didn't? I mean, why do you I make this? I would have killed, killed yourself. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, there's Absolutely. one positive thing about drugs. Jeez. Yeah, that's the first thing too I've ever heard. <laughs> Oh, that's true. You know, oh I, what happened is eventually that catches up on you. Um, you know, there was one day I was sitting in my Honda Accord. I actually had some minors in my car, 17, 16 year olds. I had just turned 18 years old and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm lining out the Coke. Right. And I'm yeah. showing off all my drugs. And there's then the three cops park right behind me. Their lights on. And I'm oh, like, boy. fuck fuck i'm with i'm with i'm with minors i just turned 18 Mm -hmm. and not to mention i didn't just have coke i had a a meth pipe i had an eight ball of meth i had um an eight ball of cocaine i had an ounce of weed and like three grams of uh of hash all in my car under my seat and i was getting minors high and so what happened is i i went to jail i went to sac county jail and it scared the shit out of me bro it Mm. I did not belong there. I was about 125 pounds probably at that point. Wow. Sucked up, skinny. I hadn't eaten in like three weeks, you know. What? And oh, my gosh. Yeah, it, I didn't sleep or eat for three weeks at a time. It, like, I was taking enough methamphetamine that I was scaring these people that have been doing it for 20 years around me. I was, They were like, dude, wow. you need to slow down. I was like, no, I'm good. I started – I mean, I actually – got psychosis to where there was points where I was talking to myself. I was seeing demons. I was just skipping through time, like straight up. I'd wake up in places I didn't know what the fuck happened and complete psychosis. I'd hear my dad's voice in my head. I'd see my dad in the windows, like some trippy, trippy stuff. I was deep. Uh, I was that guy Mm. on the side of the road yelling at cars, you know, that was me. Yeah. So this is just to give you like a good idea of where I've come from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How dark and how deep it actually got for me, you know, and I hope that this can give hope to anybody out there that thinks that they're fucked or they can't get out of a situation. You can absolutely, you can, you can recover from that. I've always wondered like how, how someone recovers from that. I remember, um, I have a summer home in Lake Placid. My family does. And and one summer I'm up there and uh, a friend, said, Hey, you know, there's this, uh, there's this homeless guy who's been wanting the streets and, um, we were pretty sure he's a seal. Really? And I'm like, okay. And so I'm like, I got to find this guy, you know, like I, this is my brother. Like, what the fuck's going on? And so I go and, um, sure enough, I don't remember his name now, but this guy had been at dev Grew. He was seal team six guy Wow. and yeah. he's homeless. And he was just like you described. Sad. He wasn't he wasn't as um he, he wasn't as um strung out as probably you described you were yeah because i actually kind of sort of had a conversation with him he did not yeah. want my help he was right. definitely not all there like he was yeah. had had a psychotic break or something mm-hmm. and um he didn't give two shits about me that i was a seal and was there to help him out and like so conversation yeah. was short as you can imagine with those types of people because yeah. you were one of them but um, I wondered, you know, like whatever happened to him, is there a path back for people like that? And I guess the answer is some yes and probably some no. You it's a mean? very low percentage. It, low percentage even yeah. anybody that gets addicted to meth in general, maybe they do it like 10 times. There's a very low chance that they'll ever stop. It's really? It's very low. It's that yeah, addictive. It's, mm-hmm. and, and the biggest thing is, is like a lot of people that do it end up getting cancer. It's got all sorts of nasty, gnarly chemicals in it, and it's made in people's basements out of oh my like God. raid ant spray how know. bad of a uh, epidemic is is um meth um i'd say it's a location it's a uh, location type of thing a geographical thing uh, i know mm-hmm. in the midwest it's really bad and mm-hmm. i know that you know in smaller towns it's really bad but it's it's bad right now because a lot of that stuff comes from mexico the, right. the cartel brings it in in mass amounts along with heroin as well. But I mean, you don't really hear as much comparatively to heroin because people don't generally die and overdose like you would on heroin. Right. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Like people do methods are sneaky. <laughs> right. Like you're not going to know what's going on. Like 
they're they're hiding they're fi- finding ways to survive you know and mm. so but with with i mean heroin addicts they can't even move you're gonna know you know if someone dies right, right. so yeah um it's pretty bad where i grew up it's it's really bad very small town and it's just a group of little small towns and a, a lot of my friends parents growing up were addicts and then a lot of Jeez. my friends ended up getting on you know some type of drug and mm-hmm. you know ruining their life as well i'm i'm one of the few that made it out really one of the few do you yeah. think jail helped you because a you're getting three square meals a day you're f- catching up on your sleep scared you yeah. a little bit <laughs> yeah it so. it scared me I'll, I'll tell this is kind of a funny story when i because I had a detox. I was in right. Sac County for about two weeks. And Did I they put you in like the hospital at the jail to, if you're detoxing. Just How they just put me in a cell. Just in a cell in and a let cell. you deal with it. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the biggest thing, the biggest thing is I started to crave sugar so bad. So bad. And I don't know. I know that when you quit alcohol, that's that's a symptom. But mm-hmm. basically I hadn't eaten in like three weeks. So and I didn't eat a lot before that. You know, I was about 125 pounds and I was eating like weird. I was eating the toothpaste <laughs> in my cell. I was oh, eating yeah. the toothpaste. That's how bad that craving was. Uh, just a little side note, kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> just some weird shit, you know. But in that, yeah, in that moment, I, uh, you know, obviously I detox, I slept, I ate, and it scared the shit out of me. I, it was actually one of the, the only times up until then that I, I was sober enough to see that I was going to be okay sober. Right. It gave me a little glimpse that I can actually like life's not that bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always thought that I always had to be high. I always had to run because if I don't, I'll think too much. I'll get depressed and I'll kill myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I realized like, man, like I'll be okay. And I eventually, I got out, I, went to trial and my case got dismissed. It was a, a bad search. <laughs> Thank God I don't have a felony because I was mm-hmm. looking at 10 years mm-hmm. and I walked away from it. And so, wow. yeah. Another, another intervention, <laughs> another intervention, not to mention like eight overdoses and in, in like three seizures from the time I had cancer to that moment in my life. Like, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So lots of, lots of miracles <laughs> along this, this path. And, um, I eventually get it, got off the hard stuff and mm-hmm. I, I moved up to Truckee and I started to live my own life. I actually lived in a tent in Truckee for four months and detoxed oh, more. I hope that was during the summer. Cause that's, a cool it was, place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it was, it was, it was a very fun, actually a really cool experience to do that. I, uh, I just got away from all the drugs, all the people. And I lived on my own. I isolated myself and detox. It was and smart I, to I, go into nature to do that. I mean, was that yeah. just. I mean, what t- told you to do that? Or just seemed well, right I, knew, I knew I wanted to go work at the ski resorts in the winter. So right. I, mm-hmm. I was like, if I go up there and establish myself and try to find a summer job, then I'll have a good chance of, mm-hmm. you know, being sober and then finding a job, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or getting that job. And I've always gone to Tahoe as a kid. So I, I love it. it uh, there's something about nature that's healing, you know, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. And yeah. It was great. I mean, I, I didn't have much. I had uh, a tarp, a homemade hammock. I had um, about a box of cans, canned foods and $40 for gas and ice money and some <laughs> food. I I ate chili and I killed squirrels with my guitar strings. I'm not even kidding. I snared squirrels <laughs> and I, I overcooked them and I ate them. And I put oh, them in my chili God. and I did that a lot. <laughs> wow. I... So I went from like survival mode to survival mode in a whole right. new environment. Yeah. Way. yeah. You went Tom Brownish. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Brown was, I, I did some training with him. He's got his, this wilderness survival program where you literally, you know, he teaches you that if you, you know, if you go into the wilderness with anything, but your shorts on, you know, then you probably won't, you don't know how to survive. You can right. like in, you know, a backpack and all the, you know, all the equipment yep. you get at REI to be like an, an astronaut, you know, you're going into the yeah. wilderness and you, you rely on all that stuff, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like a natives, you know, you got to live off the land and you should be thriving. It mm-hmm. sounds like you, you kind of <laughs> started that journey a little bit. Yeah. It's actually, oh, yeah. oh man, that can't it's be very easy. Well, they probably tasted great in the chili. Anyway. 
they they were food i survived that's all i cared about at that moment (laughs) (laughs) one thing i can say is that um you know being out in nature was just an eye opener to me like i i started to reflect self-reflect a lot and meditate Mm -hmm. and nothing else to do right and um that uh, i started putting all these little tools in my pocket right Mm -hmm self-reflecting meditation praying writing you? right now no, or in the story then? yeah in the, this uh, was uh like eight years ago so i was about 20 years old 19 okay. 20 years old yeah right and what you know what happened is i eventually <laughs> got it i got a job and you know i actually met my wife up there in Truckee, and you know we got married had a kid our son is four now and I wasn't done, <laughs> you know, I wasn't done. I was, I was still haven't really faced my, my past. I, I kept hiding it. I kept running from it. I kept blaming everyone else. I was the biggest victim you can meet. And what, you know, what happened is I, I started dabbling more into alcohol and the stuff mm-hmm. that's more legal, uh, but it's not necessarily better for you. And I took that to the next level. So Xanax, alcohol, Adderall, just, mm. just at heavy doses, like a bottle a night, a fifth a night. Uh, I did that for about four years. And, and when we had our son, my wife quit. We partied a lot, right? We were young, we were married, we partied. Mm-hmm. When we had our son, she quit. She got her shit together. I didn't, mm. right? And mm-hmm. what happened is I realized I couldn't, I, I couldn't quit. I was, I was just so mad at my dad. I was so mad at this lady. I was so mad at my past and everyone in the world. And I was at that point was just trying to just kill myself like slowly. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I caused a lot of pain in my own little family. I caused a lot of turmoil. I did a lot of bad things and, you know, to them and I hurt them a lot. And what happened, uh, was they packed their shit and left. Right. So Uh. yeah, there I am just a victim, just an alcoholic. Now, same problems, same past. And, you know, even the abuse thing, I never told my wife, you know, so it it got me to this point where I was alone again, just had mm-hmm. lost everything again. And it, you know, about four months later, just drinking heavily, I, I got to this moment where I was like, I'm done. I'm going to, I'm done. I'm going to kill myself. Mm-hmm. I, I made a decision. I said, I, I'm nobody wants me. Nobody loves me. You know, the cry for help. And, you know, I realized that like life wasn't worth living. I've caused so much pain. I've hurt so many people, you know, so many people have hurt me. Life sucks. I put my guac in my mouth and no, I put sure. my finger on the trigger and I started bawling my eyes out and I started having like a panic attack and it was intense. Like I was sobbing. It's not coming out of my mouth. I was going to do it, you know, and something clicked in me, something clicked in me. And what it was is I, I pictured my wife, being loved by another man. And Hmm. I pictured my son calling some other man dad. And it, it, it was enough pain right there to, to, to pull that gun out of my mouth. Wow. And I just started sobbing. I realized that it was the first time in, in my life. I realized that all my past actions got me to this point. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I, I took responsibility. I was like, wow, I did this. Because I was like, I want to be that man that that loves my wife. I want to be that man that loves my son. I could mm-hmm. be that man. I just have to change what I do now to become that. Mm-hmm. And so I, I told myself, you know, it was a it was a moment with God. It was a powerful and very purposeful moment in my life. And it was a, a complete 180 where I, I told myself and I promised myself, I'm going to do everything it takes to get them back. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do everything it takes to change and become a better person that became your why right there yeah that was it that was my uh, original intention to become better and um i spent four years or sorry four months just like learning what normal was i would i put Mm -hmm. myself in in communities at church and just you know asked a lot of questions understood and, and learned other people and what how they react and how they cope with things and you know, it was weird to me. Like people were happy. People were, it was like, this is fucking weird, dude. Like, 
<laughs> look at you these know? weird people. They're happy. Yeah. Oh in my, my head, like inside of it, it's just like, like, come on, like just intense. I'm intense. And the way I think is intense. And it's like, they're like walking on clouds out here. And I, I yeah. kind of got the EBGBs being around normal people. And I was like, this is weird. Like, it's all lovey dovey. Like I've never experienced that in my life. Um, but it was welcoming. And I, I put myself in a place where I would accept it. Mm -hmm. um, and what, and one thing I learned in that situation was I didn't want to be normal. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I just, I was like, I can't do this. Uh, but I didn't want to continue being a, a piece of shit. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be so fucked up. And so I decided to take the characteristics from them, just their, their want to be good and my intensity. And I, I created who I am today. Right. right? Yeah. And, I like that. I mean, yeah. I, I call that common, right? So my next book title is uncommon. Because okay. common is common is boring, right? Yeah, it common, is. you know, common is just following the status quo. And there's a lot of really good people that are yeah. doing common, um, and that's okay for them. But to be uncommon, you got to have that intensity, the hair on fire, you know, and and to really step forward to do something bold and courageous. And and so that's yeah. what you you intuitively came to that. That's good. Very yeah, cool, man. I've never really accepted help in my life. That's something about me I, because I had mm -hmm. trust issues with authority. Um, mm -hmm. because of what happened to me. And I, I figured a lot of this on my own, which is yeah, crazy. Right. I learned the hard way. I learned through experience and school of hard knocks. Think, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the tuition is pretty high. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not many people could afford it. <laughs> yeah. The big, you know, the big thing that I learned through all of this was that everything that happened to me happened for a reason. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I look at it now is that when we go through something hard, like hardship or struggle in life, there's a, there's a purpose happening as you're, yeah. as you're going through that. Something's and it's the holidays. Right? right. Yeah, exactly. So holidays, I know there's a lot of people listening to this. It's probably after the holidays when they listen to this, but that are struggling right now. That's but right. It's a hard time for a lot of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, I know a lot of people going through hard stuff right now and it's just, it, it it's cool to know that they're not fucked, right? Like right. something, something is happening. And really what it is, is if you look at, at pain, if you change your perspective on pain, which I've been, I've done really well at in teaching people this pain, its main purpose is growth. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Like we don't grow when we're joyful. We don't grow when we're happy. I believe that our growth comes from the hard times. It comes from the struggles. It comes from the suffering. Mm -hmm. And so that change of perspective made me realize that I have to stop running from pain and I need to face it. I need to feel mm -hmm. it and I need to let it change me. Right. Right. And so right. from that moment on to now, that's been like my journey. It's like when adversity comes or maybe this trauma has come up instead of me running from it through vices, which is the drugs that I used to take. I just, you know, I just faced it. Like, what is it trying to tell mm -hmm. me, bro? Like this, mm -hmm. this darkness, this feeling of suffering, it, it's forming me, it's shaping me. And it naturally does if you just are willing to just not, not run away from it. And right. Yeah. Stare it down and, and learn from it. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. So tell me about, um, I want to get into, so you started the business Rogers fitness and, um, like what led you to fitness and then let's talk about some of the, the core, principles that you live by and you teach. So I think that okay. that would be really valuable for some of the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, fitness came into my life at a young age, uh, at the age of eight years old. And I found pull-ups to help me with my anger. So mm. when I'd get, uh, or when my dad would hit me or whatever, you know, spank me very angrily, or I'd get made fun of, I'd get really upset. I go in the garage and I do pull-ups till I couldn't breathe. Yeah. Wow. And I, I used, and I realized really quickly that exercise helped my state of mind. It, mm -hmm. it took me from angry and upset and uncontrollable to a place in my life where I was just like, I was able to just stay calm. Like, okay, whew, I got that out. Right. Mm -hmm. I got it out. And, um, that, no, I, that was another tool I put in my, in my pocket for now. Mm -hmm. And, I, I wasn't that into fitness. I, I was into it, but I didn't eat right. I was, I was young. I was doing drugs, um, you know, but eventually fitness really turned into, you know, into my lifestyle 
when I quit drinking, I quit doing the drugs. I needed something to do, right? Mm -hmm. I need to keep my mind busy. And so I went to the gym and I, I started getting really into it. And I started realizing that, man, if I eat, which I hadn't in, in so long, you know, actually I have pretty good genetics, dude. Like I'm actually, I look different. I'm, I'm growing muscle. And um, I took that to the next level. I started eating the food. I started eating seven meals a day. Wow. And, and that started about four, uh, four years ago. I started eating seven meals a day. And I started to become extremely disciplined with that. Uh, it's, I love bodybuilding because it's a challenge. It's mm -hmm. a constant challenge. It's not a, it, you don't, you don't enjoy it just in the gym. You actually, ha it's a lifestyle. Yeah. You know, right. it's everything out of the gym is what matters in it. And so what that did is it just kept me on this path uh, of structure. Mm -hmm. You know, right. if I am controlling what I ingest and I control or, or I put some stress on my body every day, what I realize is that it gives me a sense of control and it helps me, it helps build my character. So what mm -hmm. I mean by that is uh, one of the key values I live by is intentional suffering, intentional stress. So one thing mm -hmm. that I do every day is I wake up and I put on a hoodie and I get on the stair stepper and I go as hard as I can mm -hmm. um, for like 30, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, depending on my day. And I just, I, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. And I, and I love, but one but thing that I've learned feeling of accomplishment. Yeah. One thing that I learned is that there's this point where when you hate it and your skin's crawling and you want to get out, just like in, in a life situation where it's, it's you're struggling, mm -hmm. you can, you can change your perspective on that. And I yeah. believe that the, the same place in your brain, uh, this is facts, the same place in your brains that, uh, receives, you know, pain is the same place that you'll, it, it's a pleasure point in your brain as well. Right. So like, right. You can trick your brain into it. There's this, there's this alpha inside of you. There's this monster inside of you that can just like change how you feel about something. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and just, you can power through it. And I just, I love that. And so what I, what I teach my clients and my followers is if we intentionally put chaos, stress and suffering in our life, which through training or for you, it was the Navy SEALs. You, mm -hmm. you did that intentionally. Mm -hmm. You yeah. get rewarded at the end of it, it, right. it your tolerance to stress in the outside world man compared to the seals like you mm -hmm. can handle situations way better your stress mm -hmm. management's on point and i think that's mm -hmm. a key thing to uh you know living a successful life is I agree. not letting everything affect you negatively right. Right? i love that in my book the way of the seal i have a chapter called or a section called go to the challenge or the challenge will come to you yeah. And so that, that's just speaking to what you're doing is like, do something, right. do it hard, do something hard every day, do something harder every week, once a week, do something even harder once a month, do yeah. something even harder once a quarter, and then do something really effing hard once a year. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? And no, then when 100%. you do that, both the preparation and the insight and the suffering, and then like you said, changing um, the suffering into reward and pleasure, it's just through the process of understanding how it's making you grow and and then you start to just, it, it shifts your entire perspective on life. Then there is no challenge yeah. externally that can affect you because you've already brought it to yourself, you know? Yeah. You can't run from pain. You can't, <laughs> yeah. but you, you can, can embrace the suck of it. Exactly. And use yeah, exactly. it for your, use it for growth. That's yeah, awesome. So what, what else are like some big guiding principles for you? That was a great Man, one. Man, uh, well, obviously the discipline and the way I, mm -hmm. I teach that is by controlling what you ingest. Because mm -hmm. when you can control what you ingest, and I mean committing 100% to it, right. uh, you can start to control your energy. You can start to control your attitude. You can start mm -hmm. to control your reactions and your emotions to things. So I, right. I think that's key to building character. And, and the goal for myself and some of my clients, hopefully all of them, is to get to this point where your character is so strong that you don't break conduct uh, in any situation. So. Right. Right. And I, I kind of look at Jesus Christ to this because, you know, he was the most disciplined man in the world. He was mm -hmm. that ever walked on this earth. And when he got you, you, you get slapped, turn the other cheek like he didn't react yeah. like he had that much control. And that's like something that I aspire because I know that I've lost everything three times in my life and it can happen again. Mm -hmm. Next time it happens, if it does, I want to be so strong in my character 
that I don't stop my routine. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't change my values. I don't change my morals. I don't, it doesn't affect me because my identity is in my character. It's that's not right. in what I have. Not in the external you know? things. Yeah. That's cool. I'd like to, to pause, you know, this idea of thinking of Jesus as discipline is so accurate. And the, the root of the word discipline is disciple. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so yeah. he had disciples who put him above their needs, which helped them with their growth, growth. but also, yeah. you know, Jesus was a disciple to something higher than his needs, higher than himself, yeah. which is God, the, you know, his, the Father, mm-hmm. capital F. I think that's really powerful, right? So when we put something higher as our main thing and we, and we commit to that, and then living in integrity with that means that we're yeah. not going to take actions that take us out of alignment. Yeah. And, and to exactly. include honoring the body, right? And so yeah. powerful. That's yeah, good. I believe that uh, discipline is truly just obedience to God. Yeah, yeah. Right? And like taking care of your body, like you just said. Like what I, I believe that the more disciplined you are in life, the more, which is the more obedient you are to your creator, whoever that is, mm-hmm. the, the quicker you'll be shown your purpose. And I agree with that. Yeah. You're not distracted by everything else everybody, that everybody else is distracted by. You're focused. You're focused. You're clear-headed. You're not putting bad things in your body. You're going to be shown way more opportunity than anybody else, which is going to take right. you higher than the standard of life, and it's going to separate you from ordinary every day. Mm. Right. Yeah. So, I love that. Yeah. I, I Basically, what I did is I became a good influence instead of a bad influence, you mm-hmm. know? I'm either or I'm a, I'm a black and white type of person. I'm bipolar, mm-hmm. like legitimately. So oh, yeah. like, yeah, yeah that's kind of, I have a YouTube channel called the polarizing effect because of that. I'm, you know, I'm a different person sometimes. It depends on the situation, but I go all mm-hmm. in, you know, right. and I, I believe that it's been a driving force to get me to this place, you know, Interesting. because I, yeah. I don't backstep. I, I don't backstep. And if I do, Man, it's bad. <laughs> so I make sure I don't. <laughs> uh, oh my god! What's your daily routine look like nowadays? My daily routine: um, I wake up at four thirty a.m. and I have an intention behind everything that I do. I have a purpose be- behind everything I do every day. Nice. Um, it, the intention of waking up early um, is to wake up and in suffering, right? Instead mm-hmm. of hitting that snooze button, when you hit that snooze button, you immediately seek comfort and Mm -hmm. what i notice is when i hit that snooze button i'll hit that snooze button in every part of my life after that that day (laughs) i'll I'll eat i'll sneak in a rice krispie treat you know Uh, exactly yeah and so when you wake up and in the first action you take is to choose uh purpose over pleasure Mm -hmm. then you're gonna you're gonna have more of a a different kind of mindset walking through it uh next thing i do is i jump on that stair climber and i put myself through uh, as as big of much pain as I can in 30 to 45 minutes. And I, I just, I practice my, my self-talk at that moment. I, you. you know, one thing I struggled with my whole life was self-doubt because of what my dad told me that I was, I was a bitch. I was a pussy. I was a mama's boy. I'd never amount to anything. That voice in my head has been just, it's been ringing my whole life. And that's what I used to call myself. What you believe you become and, you know, that repetitive self-talk will turn you into that thing. So I changed that to good um, and I'm starting to become it. Right. And so yeah. then next thing I do is I uh, eat a, a good one of my seven meals, a good whole uh, food meal. And I do my praying. I, I read the Bible. I read. I educate myself somehow either on business or, you know, mindset through like self-help books or business books. Uh, and then I self-reflect. So I'll write down the things that I feel I should, I could have done better on yesterday, right? Like behavior wise or attitude wise or reaction wise. And I do whatever I can today. I'll set a plan to fix those or to, to do better. Mm -hmm. Um, I set my goals for the day. I time management every second is accounted for. And, and, you know, later on in the day I go to the gym, I train as hard as I can and just to, run the business and be a good father. I got my wife and kid back, you know, by the way, they're back in my life. I've gained everything back and Mm -hmm. way more Mm -hmm. from changing my life. Wow. What a cool story. 
and I feel like you're just getting warmed up, you know, because yeah. it's the positive, <laughs> you know, here's the interesting thing. It took you like 24 years of hell to begin to, you know, to find four years of like, wow. And so you're just building the foundation for, for the greatness yeah. that's to come built on yeah. the foundation of all that, all the learnings, and all the lessons from the suffering. Yeah. Every that's day is cool. a miracle, you know, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Back before every day, it was like, I was lucky to be alive because of what I, my lifestyle. And now it's like, I wake up and I'm like, I'm alive and it feels good. And I can take yeah. steps towards my vision and my future. Mm -hmm. Man, being on this podcast, the fact that I'm on this podcast, Eric Rogers, mm -hmm. the guy that a lot of that I that hurt a lot of people, the guy that nobody trusted in the past, can sit here and, and be a teacher to other men mm -hmm. and women and mm -hmm. an influence and, and be in front of your audience, which man, this is one of the biggest accomplishments I've ever had in my life. I'm just going to be That's straight up cool. with you. Yeah. It, my, my purpose and my vision is unfolding and I believe it's because of my discipline and obedience yep. to God. hundred yeah. percent. And, and your humility. Yeah. Right. So right. you recognize that it's, it's not just you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, life, uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, teachers along the way, be they good or bad people. Right. But they're all, you, everyone's a teacher. If we, like you said, even the, the suffering itself is your teacher. Nature right. was your teacher. Yeah. Your wife, uh, was your teacher, right. To the hold the mirror, up, to hold the mirror up to you and say, yeah. you know, you're, you're this, and that's not what I want. Yeah, and then you had exactly. to look at that and be like, "Oh shit!" I can see why she doesn't want this. Yeah, because <laughs> this sucks. What I'm doing right, right. now sucks. So you yeah, and I think that. I think there's a lot of um, actually, I'd say the majority of people my age or or younger have a hard time reflecting on where mm -hmm. they are in life or who they are, how they're behaving, you know. Yeah. And I, I believe that most people have to hit a rock bottom before they can have that awakening, that change of mindset. It's unfortunate, but that seems to be common because our society doesn't provide rites of passage, doesn't provide education around the need for reflection yeah. and keeps people constantly distracted and, yeah. and thinking that they have to be as a professional overcommitted, overworked. And as a kid, you know, the next shiny thing on TikTok or, or YouTube, right, keeps them constantly yeah. distracted. So they're not taught to reflect. I, I was um, fortunate enough to you know, similar, but dissimilar. I didn't get into drugs, but, um, def I had the, my battles with alcohol for sure when I was younger, but, yeah. um, I found nature early and nature because of my privilege of having that summer home in the Adirondacks. I was like, I'm not staying indoors, you know, cause it's not safe there. Right. So I spent all my time outside. That's why I look at your right. time in Tahoe is that, that four months equals 40 years of greatness, right? That yeah, nature absolutely. just fed you right there, you know, not just yeah. the squirrels, just fed your spirit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. for me, being outside all the time with the silence of nature and hiking and running and getting my, you know, energy out, what an incredible, like I, it was a lifetime of learning to be okay being mm -hmm. quiet and to look within. And then, so yeah. then when I found meditation at 20 years old, or 21, maybe I can't remember 1985. Um, it felt like coming home. Right. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I feel very blessed to, to have stumbled upon meditation. Um, but it was, it was a foundation of spending time in nature that taught me that, you know, constantly avoiding the pain and suffering and the, the chaos um, through distraction is, you know, it's a slippery slope and then it's it going to lead event eventually to that serious wake up call through either a disease or some rock bottom through burnout or depression or suicidal thoughts or you name it, right? It's going to be different for every individual. Yeah. But there's a way yeah. out, right? You don't have to get there. You can just start today yeah. to be more disciplined, to become a disciple to something higher, your God, whatever that, whatever word you want to use or concept you want to use there. And to start taking time to reflect and to journal and to do hard things. Yeah. To yeah, grow. I believe, I believe that I think, I mean, this is just what I think that a lot of men look at superheroes and, and we, the superheroes have this character, right? That yeah. we kind of wish we had like this assertiveness and strength and mm -hmm. doesn't break for anything, you know, and that's actually something that is achievable 
And I know that you have that, Mark. I do. I, I see it in you. And and it's totally possible for anyone to have. And, and really what it is, is you're, you're establishing this character that, you know, no matter what happens, you're going to be this identity and it won't shift. Right. It, it won't right. change. It won't, it won't, because what happens when you change who you are in this situation, you're going to see a lot of turmoil in your life and you're going to be, it's not, it's going to be hard to c- control it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, consistency with character is definitely uh, something I've learned that is important to have when you're trying to, you know, be successful or become, you know, something better in life. I love that. Integrity is consistency of character. Yeah. Alignment yep. of thought, words, deeds, actions, and emotions, you know? Yeah. yeah. Everything is alignment, but it, it takes a lot of clarity to, to live in integrity. So then Absolutely. clarity comes from in, introspection. It doesn't come from yeah. scrolling the, the YouTube channel and seeing what's next. <laughs> right, right. So get off, get off here and go and go work. <laughs> yeah. Go work hard. Yeah, do something yeah. hard and uh, or spend out. time in meditation, which is hard. Yeah, absolutely. Hard work. Hard work works. <laughs> it does work. That's true. It definitely works. Hey, we're gonna work hard no matter what. Yeah. Well, no matter what we are, but you know, I'm telling everyone else, just embrace the suck of hard work until it becomes fun. Yeah. You know, that's kind of a, one of my primary message for through SealFit is like, yeah, it might suck for a little while, but then eventually it's like a blast. Doing that hardcore workout every day is fun. It is so fun. make it fun and do it with a team yeah. and have fun, right? And suddenly, like you're doing the uncommon things uncommonly yeah. well. Yeah. That was my honor man certificate said, you know, definition of extraordinary is when you do extraordinary things extraordinarily well. I was like, yeah, right. I, like that. <laughs> <That's>, I love <laughs> it. Let's go That's with that. Awesome. Right? Yeah, I love that. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. man. Well, Eric, it's been awesome uh, talking to you. What's next for you? Like, wh- what are, what's big for you in 2022? Oh man, 2022, I do plan on starting a new business and okay. what I want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an apparel company with, with a message behind it, a movement behind it. And, Sweet. you know, it may not launch this year. It, you know, I'm going to be doing everything I can for it. Um, but I'm also going to continue to build my coaching business. It's done very well. And, you know, I've helped over 200 people in the last year and a half and really nice. helped people change their lives and get in the best shape of their life. And it's all sustainable and it's all customizable and really just continue to grow as my, as a person myself, because mm-hmm. I'm, my business ain't going to grow if I don't. And That's so right. my main focus, my main intention is, is just becoming better and more disciplined and on getting on more podcasts and sharing more mm-hmm. of my story. And I believe mm-hmm. that that purpose will unravel, you know, as it comes. Good yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing your story today with us. Uh, people can learn more about you at rogersfitnessacademy.com. Is that correct? Yep. And do you have uh, your so, you know, on social media and, and where, where yeah. would you like people to um, continue? you? Follow Give me a follow on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. And I, I do respond to messages and I do interact with my, my followers. That's the real mm-hmm. underscore Eric Rogers. I'm sure you're going to put a link on, on the, yeah, we will. The, yep. the video too. Well, some cool. people don't don't go to the website, so it's good to um, say it again. So the real underscore Eric Rogers is your Instagram. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. Cool. Great, Eric. What, what a great conversation. Super um, honored to meet you, man. And 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 you really, too, he, your story is very inspirational. And man, I'm just very happy for you that you you're at this place and you're able to help a lot of people and you have got an um, incredible future ahead of you. So let's stay in touch. And if I can do anything to help you out and support you, then I'm all in. Yeah, man. Thank you, Mark. I, I really appreciate that. And is there anything I can do for you? Is I, I mean, I'll, re- re- I'll, I'll review doing. your, <laughs> okay. I'll review <laughs> your podcast. I can't do a whole lot for you, man. You got a lot. So wow. you're killing it, man. I'm very, We're all... I'm very, um, very happy yeah. to be here. Yeah, so we're we're a team uh, trying to make the world a better place. That's the way I look at it. There's yeah, no one person is better or whatever. I mean, this is all just. Yeah, I'm 58, so wait until you're 58. <laughs> you know, you're 28, right. dude. You got yeah. 30 years to catch up, and just think about what years. you can accomplish in 30 years. That's so true. Don't yeah. compare. I do yourself. get a little impatient. <laughs> Be patient. One day, one life. I mean, is that something that you do? I know you're a very driven person. Is that something that you deal with too? Like impatience? Like It used to, but not anymore. Okay. I, I've really cultivated this this idea. And you said it earlier, you know, it's one day. 
today is your day. Yeah. It's a it's a great privilege to wake up and to yeah. be alive. And so so craft your day like a masterpiece around your purpose. And then when you when you're done, you know, be grateful that that you had this opportunity and learn the lessons and and overcome any regrets immediately. So you don't yeah. drag those kettlebells of regret to bed and then have a great night's sleep with the hope and expectation that you get another opportunity to do it tomorrow. <laughs> I love that. I but love that. But if you don't, you go to bed with no regrets. And right. that means you, you just lived a regret free life. And so if you get go to the other side, you know, you're gonna have a much better experience <laughs> than if you're filled yeah. with negative regrets. Absolutely. So anyways, that helps that. me that warriors mindset, you know, in the seals, I had to learn patience, because you know, we could be like one of the things we said is like a, a typical seal mission is is 23 hours and 30 minutes of utter boredom. Right intersected with 30 minutes of sheer terror. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So we, we all, you know, we had to say, hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, the, you, you know, the bomb goes Game off, or the, the op, you know, <laughs> you go in the door. Yeah, so it's crazy. patience is a really important thing, but it's a, it's cultivated, you, you know, and here's the other thing, the meditation really helped because meditation trains you to stop spending all your time in the future or the past. Okay. Yeah. No, I get that. You feel that, right? And so the more time you sp it's time in the future should be spent planning and visualizing. Yeah. And time in the past should become spent overcoming regrets and diminishing the energy you give to negative thoughts and emotions. That's good time wow. spent. Any yeah. other time is just is fantasy or yeah. or the the would you know world of coulda woulda shoulda. Okay. So we don't want to spend time there unless we're being very deliberate with our future and past state, you know, time. The rest of the time should be spent in the here and the now doing something productive and uh, being a good person. Yeah, I love that. That was that was beautiful. I'm that gonna... was a mini, mini unbeatable mind lesson. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, is there anything you any advice you give a 28 year old that's, you know, a business owner? I know you're a father, too, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's so many things, but business is hard. So, but embrace the suck of it and recognize yeah. that um, it never will turn out exactly the way you think. So right. instead of relying on plans, rely on your vision and win okay. in your mind, win, in the, win the vision in your mind every day by continuing to stoke the vision of what you want in the future and allow mm -hmm. your plans to be very flexible and very adaptable. Okay. Okay, I like that. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll get an expectation hangover if you feel like, you know, your plan's yeah. not meeting reality because the world's changing really fast. Yeah, you know? it does. No, I like <laughs> that. And, and your your definition of a vision, which I, I do go through that every day, I, I work on that, is just a general, like, where, like, it, I mean, you're, I guess it's like kind of more general than just like, this is exactly what I want. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you because you never know exactly what you want, unless you're going right. for something like, um, want to be a Navy SEAL, then like, even when right. I went through, I didn't know exactly what that I literally just had one recruiting video to gave me a sense of what it was gonna be like. So the right. rest was my imagination. But I, I imagined it close enough to the truth. And I imagined, I knew who I needed to be. And so I practiced in my mind, the person I needed to be to crush SEAL training and to earn yeah. the trident. And then and I visualized city. Yeah, and I exactly I visualized that training every day. And, and I have, you know, it was a very short movie clip that I created in my mind, mm -hmm. down to the graduating, right? Now, I didn't okay. visualize myself graduating as honor man, but I saw myself. Um, and I felt the experience of, of graduating. Now, I tell this story quite often, but nine months of that, I did that every single day, before I even was admitted to this, uh, to the Navy. Right. And, um, in fact, my recruiter was telling me, don't get my hopes up because they're going to take only two people from the civilian world into the SEALs that year. Most people wow. go through, come from, um, obviously, they're in the Navy, right. and Naval Academy as an officer or ROTC. And nine months of, tr of daily practice, suddenly um, something shifted inside of me. Like I, I felt this utter sense of certainty one day, uh -huh. this utter sense of certainty that I was going to be a Navy SEAL. And, and yes. about, uh, about a week later, my recruiter called and said, Hey, Mark, you're not gonna believe this. But guess what, you you got one of the two slots. And I said, I, wow. I do believe it. I actually already knew it. And he goes, Yeah, you're gonna make a great seal because you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, nah. I love that word certainty. I do. Right. And I am certain. Well, vision like, vision about gives something. you certainty. 
it does now my vision is like i see myself in front of thousands of people and that's really yep. it and yep. and like on stage and that's that's all i see it's almost a blurred and it's it's getting more clear but i think that's all i need that, so you see that see, see that that's a great vision but everyone in the audience is also wearing your apparel <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> I, got, I like that maybe i could see what type of apparel i need to make that's, that's right awesome. <laughs> cool mark i appreciate you brother i wish i could shake you ha your hand right now but thank you for your yeah, service well, we'll, and, and we'll do a mental handshake or a mental hug and uh I got stay you. in touch <laughs>